but it, well, I think everybody heard that. Welcome everybody to our annual meeting. Good evening. And I was just about to tell you all that um, we are recording this meeting, but I think you just heard it. So anyway, I'm gonna get started. My name is Julie Muckamal and I am co-president along with Hannah Hostick of the Sterling Road Library Friends Group. And I wanna welcome you all to our annual meeting this evening. Our agenda tonight will include a slideshow created by our very own board member, Joyce Abraham. We're gonna have greetings from our honorary guests and the installation of officers and board members of the Friends Group. We will then enjoy a lecture by Howard Finkelstein, who will speak about his hit creation, Help Me Howard. I'd like to now call upon my co-president, Hannah Hostick, who will say a few words and introduce our slideshow presentation. Hannah? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Julie. Navigating our journey through COVID has challenged our group on so many levels. Should we meet in person? If so, what are the guidelines? How do we continue to serve our community using Zoom? How do we handle Zoom fatigue? Will our community continue to support our group and our library during this time? The answers, my friends, are captured in the video put together by Joyce Abraham with original music composed by her talented son. Joyce? Okay, here's going. Are we ready? Okay. Thank you. 
That's it. Well, That's all, folks. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. It's really amazing to see how many programs and so many programs that were done throughout this year. And it's Lots clear that many more. Pardon? Many, many more. more that I couldn't put on. <laughs> well, you've given us a wonderful taste of it. And it's clear that even though what we hope is the tail end of a pandemic, our friends continue to see the need for a library and to connect with others who support our public library. Finding the appropriate balance between inline and in-person programs will continue to challenge us in the coming year. But we're up to that challenge. And with your support, we will continue and find innovative ways to handle that challenge. Back to you, Julie. Thanks. I'd like to now recognize and thank for their continual support our honorary board members. They are County Commissioners Beam Fur and Tim Ryan, State Representative Evan Jenny, Hollywood Mayor Josh Levy, and City Commissioner Adam Gruber. Adam Gruber will now say a few words on behalf of the honorary board. Adam? I am un oh, unmute. Okay. Hi, everybody, and uh, happy to be here. Honored to be an honorary board member. Um, you know, great to see that live programming is is back, and and, and a mix of Zoom and live programming um, is great. Um, you know, just the the amenity of, of this library and the resources it provides the community is, is just just unbelievable. Uh, personal story: My son Micah last year uh, did Florida virtual, and he probably spent eighty percent of his time, as far as his schoolwork, going to the library and, and using that and. Uh, uh, he, I don't think he would have gotten through eighth grade if that library wasn't there. We would have had to find something else. So it's much appreciated, appreciated all your efforts. Um, I think it was a year ago that I was walking through a park doing this. <laughs> so, uh, That's right. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and programming was not back. So it's just great to see. And, uh, you know, wishing you all, uh, who celebrate a sweet, happy, and most importantly, a healthy, uh, year to come and uh, just happy for all that the library provides and all the hard work of the board members and volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. We so appreciate you joining us this evening and thank you for all your support. Thank My you pleasure. very much. And now Jill Sears, the Assistant Director of Broward County Libraries will greet our members. Jill. Good evening, everyone. I hope this message finds you all in good health and good spirits. I want to convey the library division's appreciation to you as a friends group. You all embody the best of friends groups. You contribute to the well being of the community, to the library being the people's university. Um, and the library is also a cornerstone of democracy with the free sharing of information and learning. And you all are the best example of supporting us so we can continue to do that. Um, words cannot convey how much we appreciate your service to us. Um, I, that's all I really want to say is to thank you and show our appreciation. Uh, you guys are the best. Well, Jill, we want to thank you too for being with us this evening. It's nice to My see pleasure. you. My pleasure. I want to now call upon our Sterling Road Library Branch Manager, Nina Fernandez, and she will give the manager's report. Nina? Hi everyone, so great to be here. My name is Nina Fernandez, and I'm proud to say that I'm the Community Library Manager for the Sterling Bro Branch Road Library. I have been in this role since March 2021, and everyone has been so wonderful in welcoming me with open arms. As you know, our friends are a dynamic group that passionately advocates for our library. While not everyone is comfortable with attending in-person programs yet, our friends offer a wide variety of both in-person and virtual programs. The virtual programs have helped to create more new library users and friend members. As a matter of fact, thanks to their hard work and dedication, the friends are currently over 400 members, which is just incredible. It's an honor to be a part of such an amazing team. As time goes on, we are seeing an increase of the amount of people walking through our doors, which is fantastic and our entire purpose for being here. We're also seeing an increase of the number of customers attending our in-person programs. An example of this is seen with Storytime, 
What started as a group of around 30 has quickly transformed into an average of, of 70. Speaking of in-person programs, our Chair Yoga and Ageless Grace programs have been well received by the community and we've received positive feedback from everybody who's attending. Looking forward, I'm happy to share that we have some exciting projects we're working on through the generous support of our friends, such as continuing our Tail Trail, which is a fun and educational interactive activity that takes apart a children's story along our beautiful sidewalk outside. If you haven't seen it, please come and check it out. And we're currently working on a plan to look at ways to enrich and improve the user experience for both children, teens, and families in our youth service section. Working at this Sterling Road Branch Library is such a privilege and I couldn't be happier to be here. Thank you for your time. And now back to our wonderful friends. Nina, thank you on behalf of all of the friends for all of your hard work and everything that you do for our community and our library. We appreciate you so much. I'd like to now present the officers and the board to you. The nominating committee has presented its slate for 2022-2023, which you all received in your annual meeting notice. It is now my honor to instill the board. You are, at, you are tasked with promoting and supporting our public library through programming, fundraising, and advocacy. Your commitment to the library as a public space, open to all, is a critical component to the vibrancy of Broward County. We all play a role in ensuring that our library continues to flourish together with the outstanding staff of the Broward County Library and our efforts and energy should continue to create an exciting center where all our residents are welcomed and encouraged to have access to all the resources of our library system. Officers and board members, please unmute your microphone. And when I say your name, please state whether you accept this responsibility. Uh, the board members are in alphabetical order. Dick Blattner? Yes. Dick, are, okay, thank you, Dick. Christine Lorber? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Rhonda Martin? Yes. Thank you. Marilyn London? Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca Lemelman. Yes, thank you. Thank you, and Fern Cantor. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Joyce Abraham. Yes. Susan Metch. Yes. Thanks, and Kay Silver. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations to our board members. I'd like to now approve the board meeting minutes from August. Is there a motion to accept the minutes as read? Do we have a motion? Susan, well, and do we have a second? Okay, thank you, Rebecca. The minutes have passed as read. Oh, all in, wait, wait a second, all in favor? Raise your hands. Okay, great, thank you. And now the minutes from August have passed. And now we're going to do the same for the August treasurer's report. Do I have a motion to accept the treasurer's report from August as read? Okay, I'll do it. Okay, and a second from Joyce, Joyce Abraham. And all those in favor of the August uh, treasurer's report? Okay, terrific. And now the treasurer's report from August has been approved as read. The board received the proposed budget the proposed annual budget prior to this meeting. And if anyone would like a copy, please email us at sterlinglibraryfriends at gmail.com and we will send you a copy. I wanna make a motion now to accept the, um, or can I have a motion to accept the budget as read? We have anybody? Okay, Susan. We'll accept and Marilyn will second that motion. And now all those in favor of the annual budget as read. Okay, great, thank you. And now our annual budget has been approved as read. And once again, if anybody would like to see a copy, please email us at sterlinglibraryfriends at gmail.com and we will send that copy to you. I'd like to now call upon Hannah 
who will help us acknowledge our volunteers. Julie, all of our volunteers give their time for the benefit of our community. This year, we would like to spotlight five of these dedicated and wonderful friends. Deborah Perlman, Linda Bloomfield, Jan Surrett, Jackie Muzzamal, and Abby Stern. Linda, where's Linda? Is she here? Do you wanna say hello? Mm, okay. Um, Linda has been a valuable member of the membership committee, welcoming new Sterling Circle members and reminding past due members to update their membership. Jan, are you here? Do you wanna say hello? Okay, I'm sure they're here somewhere, but um, we're fortunate that Jan became part of our membership committee this year. And thanks to her, membership reminders are mailed to us timely and efficiently each month. Jackie Muzzamal, are you here? Yes. Okay, I guess our, our volunteers are being very shy tonight. Um, I am, thank you very much. Oh, hi there. So happy hi, to see Jackie. you. Um, much thanks to Jackie for the excellent emails she sends to our book club and short story participants. She's been a hands-on and she's been hands-on and keeps us well informed and up to date for which we are very grateful. Abby Stern, are you here? Mm, okay, I'm sure she's out there somewhere, but <laughs> Abby is an exceptional volunteer. She's dedicated, enthusiastic, and always ready to help. The friends of the library and the library staff in any, she's a, always ready to help the friends and the library staff in any way possible. We thank her for the many things she does for the library. Deborah Perlman, I saw you out there, so just unmute yourself and say hello. 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 Everyone. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Uh, so Deborah is responsible for the informative and attractive emails that you receive each week. She edits, designs, follows up, creates a newsletter, and she en ends up with a newsletter which has an unprecedented percentage of recipients who actually open up those emails. You know, the average out there is like 15, 20%. We get between 50 and 70%. And it's really thanks to the attractive and beautiful emails that Deborah puts together. Um, additionally, Deborah created what I believe is our most successful program during the past year. She created a curated artist showcase, which brought together a diverse group of artists from throughout South Florida. And she brought an energy to our library through that program, which was so meaningful to all of us. Deborah, thank you for your creativity, your professionalism, and dedication. We're so appreciative. Um, to each of our volunteers, those five in the spotlight tonight, and all of you who invest time in the Friends, your efforts are really deeply appreciated and, and, and recognized. We thank you on behalf of the community. Julie? We thank you. Oh, Julie, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, because of our incredible organized way of doing things, we're a bit early. So I thought that um, our, our speaker isn't here yet. And what oh, I saw- sorry, he is here. He's here under my name. He, he, he's Fern Cantor too, if you look at the list. Fern, uh, our that's, is there. that's great. <laughs> that is the incredible news, but we can't start until seven because that's the commitment. We really always start on time. And um, so what I thought we could do for the next few minutes um, is just talk about the friends and the challenges ahead. And I would love to get um, the, the views tonight of people who have come to our annual meeting. You know, in the past, when we had an annual meeting, we would actually get one person when it was live. <laughs> like, there was always someone in the community who felt that they wanted to be there, but no one else would show up except for the board. And now we have such an amazing group of people who really view the library and the friends as part of their community. And there's something magical about it. And other groups want to know what, what is it? And if there's anyone here tonight who could just speak for a minute about that, we haven't planted anyone. So I don't know if there is anyone who would be willing to speak, but if you're willing to speak, we'd love to hear from you tonight. Is there anyone who'd like to say anything? Uh, Hannah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it just off the cuff. 
Um, as you know, uh, we, we did go to Colorado very frequently uh, in the, over the summer for many years. And they have a lovely little library and they have used us uh, as mentor for ideas. Uh, I'm amazed at the ideas that we have that we take for granted. We have a, a trail tale for children that people and children walk up to our library. And I saw them the other day, two little kids with their mom reading these poster boards along the walkway. It's such a unique and clever way to show our, to use the outside and to use the inside. During this pandemic, uh, with, with our masks on, people are coming to, into the library with such joy and with such love. I mean, strangers are virtually hugging other, other, other people who they really don't know because we've given them a venue in which we can come together as a community. And not too many other communities can say that. We have a membership of over 400, and that's because of what we give out to the community. You give what you get, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm very proud to be a part of this community and of this library. Thanks, Fern. That's pretty good for off the cuff. <laughs> um, is, is there anyone else who would like to say anything in terms of any experience that you've had at the library or through the friends that you think is meaningful? The fact that you maintain Zoom meetings and you still have the art appreciation, I think, is why I am a member. That's great. You know, Dr. Bacha Cohen is such a gift. We feel very um, proud that we helped discover Bacha um, through Dora Katz, who is attending our, our program tonight. We are always on the lookout for people who we feel can bring a certain degree of um, excitement and knowledge to our members. So if anyone's out there and you have some ideas or you've seen or experienced a speaker that you think is great, we can do it either in person or on Zoom. Deborah Perlman is a fine example of someone who just wanted to create uh, an experience for other artists like herself. Um, and she was able with hard work, but with the back, the backing of the friends to put together this very unique program. So we're open to it. We've created a lot of programs that are copied in other libraries. We're very proud of that. But um, so we're we're pleased to hear that um, you've enjoyed Dr. Cohen's lectures. Anyone else has been to a lecture, or had an experience at the library through the friends that's been meaningful? May, may I say something? I'd love to hear you from you, Dora. Okay, um, as you know, I do not live in Broward County, but I belong to the Friends because it is so incredible, everything that you offer. And in, especially when we had the pandemic, it was part of my life to be able to do something um, during those days. And it's still, I'm still, um, joining in, not in person yet, but uh, by Zoom. And, and I really congratulate you and everything you have done and everything you are continuing to do. So all the best, all my best Thanks. wish. Thanks, Dora. Um, I think that you've brought up a really important point, which is that during the the, the, the real center of the pandemic, when none of us really knew what to do, we somehow transitioned quickly into Zoom. And I think that for many of us, uh, the library programs were so refreshing and helpful and made us feel connected. We had speakers that were really on, on a national level, incredible lectures, um, and even smaller programs like the short story, well, the short story group wasn't on Zoom, but the New Yorker, which was a small group where people could come and discuss issues that are, you know, current and um, of concern to them. And I think that um, it was really remarkable that when most groups, actually most friends groups died during the pandemic, they just fizzled out because they didn't know how to keep um, to, to keep going during the pandemic. And, and I think that this was pretty unusual that we were able to do that. Jillian? Yes, no, I just wanted to say thank you for the uh, book reviews, the monthly book reviews with Linda Levin. Um, those have been great. And it was great during the pandemic to have it with the JCC and have those on Zoom. And then now in person, 
they're doing in person, both in person and on the JC, at the JCC, which is great to accommodate everybody, those who want to come in and those who still want to just do Zoom. So thank you. That's been great. Thanks, Jillian. And that was one of our um, creative responses. We know that for the most part, when you do Zoom and in person at the same time, someone loses out. There'll be people either, it, it just doesn't work the way we need it to work out. And so um, the fact that the J was a willing partner and allowed us, it, it really, you know, together we created a hybrid where people could either go in person or on Zoom, I think was pretty unique and wonderful. Um, Jackie? I also think that um, it's a testament to the board also. Well, I tell people all the time, if you're bored, it's because you won't participate because there's something constantly going on. And I think that's really thank you to the board. We've been all over the United States in many different libraries. And this is literally the best $10 I have ever spent in my life, although we usually spend more. <laughs> so thanks to the board. Thanks, Jackie. That's so nice to hear. Um, I'm not sure if it's Bunny or Dick, but we take either one of you to speak. <laughs> Do you want to turn on your camera or uh, you're 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 on mute, but your can't your hand is up. So there you go. And you're so my, my hand, my hand was up to congratulate uh, Joyce for that great video and for her presentation today. Uh, that shouldn't go unrecognized. I know it wasn't. Yeah, thank you, thank, Joyce. Thank um, you, Dick. Thank you. And Joyce not only put together a great video, but thank goodness she has a very supportive son, Mickey, who with friends um, put together, well, his colleagues put together the music. Um, and we've had them in concert. They're an amazing group. Um, okay, so I, it's 657. Um, if anyone has a last remark, that's great. If not, <laughs> then uh, we're ready for um, Fern to introduce Fern, you'll have to introduce Howard very slowly so that you don't start before seven o'clock because there's <laughs> people who are showing up just at seven to hear from Help Me Howard. So um, take it away, Fern. La, 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 la. <laughs> You're being recorded. <laughs> you know, taking Hannah's words about somebody speaking with uh, excitement and knowledge. I think those that that's a little caveat for our guest tonight, Howard Finkelstein, better known as Help Me Howard. Howard is originally from New York. He received his BA from the University of South Florida and his Jewish doctor degree from the University of Miami. For most of his career, he served as public defender for Broward County and was instrumental in forming the first mental health court in the world and one of the first drug courts in Florida. As on-air legal analyst for Channel 7, he gave legal commentary on the O.J. Simpson case, as well as President Clinton impeachment proceedings, the Princess Diana investigation, and so many more. His featured Help Me Howard, along with Patrick Fraser, has become a household stable for the past 24 years. Howard has a personal connection with the importance of libraries as his wife, Donna, is a librarian who worked with our Broward County Library System for many years. And I hope Donna is on so we can thank her also, Howard. What's behind the success of Help Me Howard? What drives the 24 years of resolution of issues that people find so impossible to resolve? We're waiting to hear from Howard Finkelstein, Help Me Howard, who's going to answer those questions to tell us how it all began and why he believes it is still going strong. It's my pleasure to turn over to Help Me Howard. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure. Um, the work you do is truly important, probably more important now than librarians and libraries have been maybe in the history of this country. Um, so I salute you, I support you. Um, and you have a tough road coming um, for you in the years to come. Um, Help Me Howard, I think it brings both good and bad about our community. And let, let me tell you how it started. Um, me, my wife Donna and our kids were visiting people, our friends of ours up in Tennessee. 
And we're watching a basketball game and in the middle of the basketball game, all of a sudden the screen splits in half and there's a white Bronco driving down a highway outside of Los Angeles. Of course, I'm like everybody else, you know, get that off, I wanna watch the game. Who knew that that white Bronco and OJ Simpson was about to change my life and my family's life forever and ever. So what happens is, is that they set the OJ case down for a preliminary hearing. And I, I get a call and they want me to go on and describe it. Now, we're all sophisticated now, but if you remember back when OJ happened, nobody had ever watched trials. There hadn't been, the last thing that had been televised was the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. So all of a sudden, America has become obsessed with the OJ case. So they call me and they ask me if I would go on and I would do the analysis. Well, I'm married to a librarian. So I said, let me go and call my wife and see. So I call my wife and I say to her, you know, I, I don't know about doing this. And she said, what, what's your concern? I said, well, you know, I don't practice in California. I'm afraid that I'm gonna go on air and people are gonna realize I'm not as smart as they think I am. To which she looked at me and said, nobody thinks you're that damn smart anyhow. So with that, I proceeded. And as you all know, what happened with OJ was Patrick and I were doing, and it shows you how much times have changed. We were the razor's edge because people could fax us questions live on TV. Fax machines were like magic at that time. And the they would see their question actually come across the fax machine. Patrick would ask the question. And now I had been a public defender my whole career. So with that comes a lot of your liberal philosophies and beliefs about criminal justice. And so when I would get a question, I would answer it in with my normal philosophical and personal agenda. Well, I realized within five minutes because I could see how the faxes were changing that I had a higher obligation here. I had a moral obligation. People were reacting to what I said and they were believing it. They were seeking out the truth. And it was in that moment, that epiphany, when I realized, no, I'm gonna tell them what each side is doing, why they're doing it, what they hope to achieve. And I'm gonna invest in the common sense of the American people and let them decide what is right and what is wrong. The point being is people were so receptive to that because you turn on the TV and it's nothing but talking heads and everybody's telling you what you need to think and why you need to think it. I didn't go that way. So OJ happens and all of a sudden this little public defender who grew up in Hollywood, Florida and went to South Broward High School becomes this huge household name. And when it was over, there was this huge crash and we went back to life raising our kids and being, being a public defender and my wife being a librarian. And then I got a phone call and they wanted to capture what we had done with OJ. And they came up with this idea called Help Me Howard. And they tell me this and I said, you know, my wife's a librarian. I got to call her and ask her. Okay, so I call her. And she says, so what's your concern? I said, but it sounded so cheesy. Help me, Howard, I don't know, you know? And I look at her and I start to say, and I'm afraid, and she gives me that look that librarians have, which is, haven't we been through this once before? And so we decide that we're gonna give this a shot. So I call the station back and I say, you know, I've never handled the civil case, not one. I've been a public defender my whole career. I don't know anything about civil law. And the answer I got was, it's TV. It's not brain surgery. So Patrick and I decide, now Patrick is a good Catholic boy and I'm a good Jewish boy. And we figured we had maybe one year to go out and help as many people as we could. That was our idea. It was a, a mitzvah show, if you would. And so we earnestly went at it. That was 24 years ago. And the fact that it's still going is the point that, that I'm, 
trying to get to, which is the reason that Help Me Howard is a success and it works is not because of Patrick and I. We are not that smart. We are not that good looking. We aren't the reason that people have been watching this for 24 years. The reason, and Patrick and I realized this in the very beginning, is people are basically good. And sometimes we forget that because we live in this world now where everybody's got a bullhorn. Everybody is angry and screaming and nobody's listening. The truth is most people are good and they don't like it when something wrong happens to someone and they get, for lack of a better word, screwed. Nobody likes to see it. So all we are is the vehicle to write something that has become wrong. And the people not only watch, but people respond when we give them a call. Now, for years as a lawyer, I might call somebody who did something wrong and they would say, screw you, hang up on me, whatever it might be. All of a sudden, now that I'm on TV, I am a far better lawyer because I call and all of a sudden the answers are, Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Finkelstein. I didn't understand that. Send him over and we'll give him back his money. Well, we all know it's not because I'm a better lawyer. We all know it's because of the power of TV. And the good news is when you harness that power for good, you can change the arc of somebody's life in a dramatic fashion. <clears throat> Just to give you an example, and this is, was my favorite episode. We did three different um, uh, chapters of it. Someone comes to us. Now, most of you know that most of us, what we deal with are leaky faucets and somebody who buys a product that doesn't work or a neighbor's tree is, is um, the roots are starting to come across your property line. Well, every now and then something comes across where it just stops you. And a woman by the name of Margaret Daigle calls and says that she needs a liver transplant. And at the time, the only place you could get a liver transplant was at Jackson Memorial. That was the transplant hospital that was down here. And she goes down there and they said, okay, it'll be $250,000 down and $250,000 after the transplant. Well, she'd been a waitress all of her life. She didn't have $500,000. And so she contacted us and it didn't sit right. We didn't know why. And we began to investigate. And what we found out was, one, that in Miami, because they have a penny sales tax that, tax that goes to indigent healthcare, um, transplants can be had by poor people. So we filed a public records request and we wanted to find the name of every indigent person from Broward County that had gotten a transplant in what, I forgot what year it was. And we get back the answer, zero. Okay, so that means either Broward County has the healthiest homeless people in the history of the world or they're being denied transplants. So we start making phone calls and we try to find out because there's supposedly a path for those who are from Broward and um, are in need of a transplant. Miami-Dade doesn't wanna pay for Broward citizens to have a transplant. Then I found out that one of our commissioners, child had had a transplant. And then I knew something was afoot. Everything number that we called referred us to another number. And that referred us to another and to another. And we never got to a person. The whole system was set up so that if you were poor and you were from Broward, you would die. It was set up that way, it was intentional, and it was hidden. Once we exposed it in the first show, well, all of a sudden it got everybody's attention. And as a result, Margaret got her liver, it saved her life. She lived for five years after that and had a wonderful life during that time. And Broward County opened up a transplant center for those citizens in Broward County who are poor. That 
stopped Patrick and I in, in our tracks. This was so over our head, so outside of what we were doing. And we came to realize that we were becoming part of the safety net in South Florida. And that is a little scary. And like I said, the thing, the story about Help Me Howard is both good news and bad news. It's the best of things in the world and it's the worst of things. The fact that you need a show, and we're a TV show. We don't have a big staff. It's Patrick, it's me, my good buddy that I went to high school with and have been friends all my life, Steve Michelson does the research. That's it. We don't, we, there's no minions running out and, and doing all this. And the fact that we don't have a sufficient safety net in South Florida is the reason that we exist. And when you're poor, and I'm not telling you anything that you don't know because libraries have become the repository of poor people's children so that they can work during the day so that they can feed them at night. Um, when you're poor and you can't afford a lawyer and you don't have a voice, well, when your apartment has feces bubbling up through the sink and through the toilet, what do you do? They live like that. But when they place a phone call to us and we can put a camera, a light on it, all of a sudden their lives change. Even things like there was a woman who'd been homeless for 20 years and she called us, she was in jail. And all she wanted was teeth, teeth. We were able to get her teeth. We were able to get her out. And because of viewers, you have no idea. People send money. You see these people on, on TV and um, there are so many people in the community that send big amounts of money and dollars and coins because their heart tells them to help. Well, this woman who'd been homeless for 20 years now is an apartment that she pays for because she has a job. Um, I don't know if you just saw a few weeks ago, we did one with a woman with six children, homeless, looking for a place, any place, and she was fleeing from an abusive husband. Um, it was very difficult because she didn't have birth certificates, she didn't have, the history was all messed up, and she was trying to keep her location secret from the person that was pursuing her. Um, we told that story. That person now, those kids are not sleeping on a bench anymore. They're sleeping in a bed. Those are the stories that make Patrick and I just so grateful. Um, I told you that um, in many ways, this is because he's a good Catholic boy. I'm a good Jewish boy. We're, we get the honor to be the fingers of God, to help people. And... Patrick and I know it has nothing to do with us. Like I said, neither one of us are ever going to be in GQ for our looks, for our bodies, for, for our minds or any of that. We really are two just regular guys. Um, Patrick grew up um, working class. I grew up working class. Our heart is with helping people. And the truth is, it's done more for Patrick and I than for all of the people that we've been able to tell stories about. Um, whether it's puppy lemon laws, you go and you buy a puppy, they tell you and you love this puppy and it's sick and they don't wanna treat it. Your choice is either give back the puppy to get your money back knowing they're gonna kill that puppy. Um, whether it's helping there, whether it's finding the lost dog of a little girl or getting back a dog that belonged to the deceased child of someone, um, whether it is, and the problems go on and on and on. There are so many problems that people have. And I'm sure you guys have noticed, life is getting harder and harder. And it's harder to make ends meet. Look at what's happened in our housing market here. The people that we're trying to help are the people directly affected who can afford $2,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment? We have lost control. And when you're poor, it's very easy to fall off the rungs, the lower rungs of the ladder. Now, we don't always just feature poor people. A lot of times it's regular people. You go in, um, we, we've had people who've given money to plastic surgeons and then the plastic surgeon didn't want to do the surgery and didn't want to give back the money. So 
it can be a wide variety, but I think the, the important message that I know Patrick and I want to get across is there are so many good people in our community. They really are. They care. They want to help. They will help. And we have just gotten lost, not just our community, but as a country. Um, the divisions in this country, whether they're political, whether they're racial, whether they're class, have reached a point where we no longer see the person in front of us. We just yell at them. If we take the time, what I have found is Americans are special people. We really do care and we really do want it to be right. And we don't like it when people are hurting. And that's what helped me, Howard, has been a success. And like I said, we're finishing up, I think, 24 years, which um, I told you when we started, Patrick and I figured we had one year at most to do it. And nobody's more surprised than Patrick and I at the love, the affection, the success, and the reaction of people to it. Um, I can't tell you strongly enough what an honor it is when you get to be the vehicle. See, so you watch the show. I actually see them break down where they have hope, where they had nothing before, nothing, nothing, and nowhere to go and nowhere to turn. And they got to the right person. And the reason Patrick and I are able to do things is not because we're smart, because we're able to find the right person to ask. And if you find the right person to ask, you almost always get the right reaction. And that is how Help Me Howard got started. That's how it evolved. Um, and at this point, there's, it seems like it's gonna keep going for a few years. Although Patrick and I are getting so long in the tooth, they may throw us off TV. Um, but that's, that's how, um, it changed my life in every way that you can imagine. And Patrick and I like to think that the people's lives we were able to change have gone out and done something good for other people. And that's how it happens. You pass it forward, you change the world one act at a time. Howard, what you say is, is just, it, it's so meaningful and you've had so many years of this. Uh, would you be willing to answer, uh, some, people are putting things into the chat room, any questions that they have, please put them in the chat and I'll, I'll you know, uh, we have somebody said- uh, Fern, yes. Fern before, before we get to the questions, yes. I just want to ask people that um, if they're going to ask questions tonight, this program is being recorded. So please don't use names of people that you know, have yeah. bothered you, and have troubled you, and um, you know, and and I'm sure. Uh, well, that's really uh, all I yeah. to say. I'll I'll, I'll 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 screen them out if you want. Let's see, let's see. Uh, you, you're getting a lot of thank you, Howards and uh, Gail Cohen, and everyone said thank you so much. Uh, uh, there is uh, there was a comment uh, made, but there are so many. <laughs> down here not so much in new england where i come from but down here you have to be so careful who you hire why don't you talk about that howard well but i know you've had some a lot of issues with contractors yeah that that's a bad one south florida has a, is notorious for it um and a lot of the people that are here and it's going to get worse because the workers are not going to be able to afford to live in broward county or dade county so they're gonna be workers living elsewhere in the state coming in, trying to do a job here or there. Um, we don't have good regulation. We don't have good standards. We, as a rule, have very poor workmen. But let me tell you the other side. My house burned down two years ago. Um, for some of you might know that. And, you know, despite all the trauma that goes along with it, the insurance company and the contractors who rebuilt the house were just phenomenal. It's like anything else. There are some very good contractors out there and very good workmen. And there's also some people out there that are not very good, 
The ones you have to be careful about are the ones that are really not contractors and they're working under some other, other contractor's license. That's usually a red flag. Um, sometimes they're doing it validly, sometimes they're not. The most important thing I can tell anyone listening in this regard, do not pay all the money upfront. Your biggest protection is to do it in fourths or thirds and pay it as the work is done. Because in the end, once you have paid them fully, you know, they're going to get to you when they get to you, if they get to you at all. But if they know that one third of the money is still going to come to them when they complete it, that's their profit. So their incentive is to complete the job. Okay. Thank you. We're getting a lot more thank you. Uh, Julian yeah. Rice, thank you for all that you do. Who writes the puns at the end of your stories? <laughs> Uh, the puns, that's a, also a great story. It's Patrick. Patrick is, and, and Patrick's a shy boy. Patrick doesn't like public speaking, but Patrick likes to play like he's a dumb country boy. Patrick is brilliant um, and such a talented writer. The puns are all his. When, it, when the show first started, I'm told that the owner hated it. I didn't even understand them. It was like, I remember when Lawton Charles was running for governor and in the last debate, he stood up there and he said something about when the heat coon stands before them, the morning light. And I'm going, I, I'm a city kid. I don't even know what they're talking about. Patrick does it. And the funny thing is wherever I go, I hear, I hate those puns. And everyone then tells me word for word what the pun was. And what we've learned is people love to hate those puns. And that's why they're part of it. Oh, wonderful. Great. That's a guy nice up. Patrick, we have to thank Patrick because Patrick was, 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 was the one who said, how, this might be something Howard would want to do. And, it, and we're, so, we're so grateful to him. So please thank him also, Howard. Please thank I, him. OK, I, uh, uh, more, more on the contractors. Uh, let's see, and especially people appreciate how the story started, how the story started. Uh, go ahead. Somebody want to say something? I think there was somebody else who was wanting to speak. I, I have a question actually. Um, Howard, how do you choose which stories to uh, include? Because it seems like you must have so many people who write to you for help. Uh, no, that's a great question. and. I, like, I wish I could tell you there was a method to the madness. Here are the questions that we ask ourselves. Is it important that we can educate people? Um, is it something we can do something about? Sometimes someone will come to us and it's a problem. The, the smaller the money involved, the greater the chance of success. If people are arguing over $300,000, they don't give a wit if they give a phone, get a phone call from me or not. Um, but we, we look at, can we make a difference? Can we educate people? And then they're the ones that just either pull on our heartstrings or hit our funny bone. Um, and Patrick is the one that ultimately makes that decision because he's the one who has to write the story. And you'll notice how it's really very simple, our equation. We, you, we introduce you to somebody and we tell you something about it. We try to give you kind of a flavor of, who this person is, their, their humanity, you hear about their problem, I pop up and tell you what the law is or what it should be, and then hopefully we resolve it, and then it ends with a pun. And so um, it all goes into that kind of hopper, um, and then they're the ones that, like I said, if they, if they hit your heartstrings, the Margaret Dakel who needed a transplant, that's something you, you don't look away from a mother with three kids that's homeless or people living with sewage bubbling up out of their bathtub. Those are ones that you can't look away because if we don't do it, there's nobody. And that's the bad part of our community. Um, like I said, if we had a good safety net in South Florida, there would be no help me out. Howard, I wanna ask you a question if I may. And that question is, with 24 years of impact and intelligence and visibility, 
have seen, I mean, you've gotten Broward County to do the, uh, the law on, uh, for, 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 the, for the indigent. Has there been any other changes because of Help Me Howard's visibility out in the community? Yeah, you know, it, and it shocks Patrick and I. We'll do a, a, an episode, and it, if it's an issue that's a cutting edge issue, you can bet that week it'll be shown in the legislature. And there have been many laws that change. One of the things I forgot to tell the story we had is parents contact us. They have a young infant and he had, I can't recall what it's called, but it has to do with the swelling of the skull and all that. And there was a helmet that was experimental at the time. And we got involved and we got this kid, this helmet, it, it, it wasn't expensive, but he couldn't, the family couldn't have afforded it and he couldn't have gotten it that kid ended up becoming valedictorian of his high school um, 20 some odd or 18 years later. Um, so that was one of the, the more moving things. We've had um, police departments when we do episodes, we'll call and it's really funny because you know my whole career is a public defender and the police chief will call and want to know what Howard thinks about it and whether they should do it. And Patrick and I just get the biggest kick out of it which brings me back to that original lesson of morality, which is I can't ever come to fool you. I have to tell you the truth because when people give you that platform, they give you that ability to effectuate change, you damn well better tell the truth. Uh, some, uh, let's see, Gail said too, uh, you mentioned some stories that are funny. Can you tell us about one? Oh, we've had, um, <laughs> we did one on the Scogie Ducks. This is way back in the beginning. And if I recall the law, the Scogie Ducks are not indigenous to this area. And basically, if an animal is not indigenous, it's like the big iguanas that we have around here now, you can kill them. Right? It just has to be done humanely. So I said that on air. Well, there was an explosion. Every animal lover on the planet wanted me and Patrick dead. And I remember the executive producer calling and saying, it doesn't matter. Howard will never go on TV and say you can kill an animal ever again. Um, <laughs> But that became important for people um, who have uh, serious issues. Um, we don't obviously recommend it, but the reaction of people was, was something else. Um, we've done some, uh, you know, helping neighbors. One neighbor, he's smoking pot constantly out on his patio and it's driving the other neighbor crazy. You know, as a kid from the 60s, it wasn't hard. I said, just smoke it inside, please. Okay, so, you know, it, it, people are people. And, you know, as our life gets harder and we feel we have less energy, our body aches, you know, we have financial issues, all of a sudden what our neighbor does really ticks us off. It becomes so amplified. All of a sudden the roots of their tree which are just now starting to come under your fence, you know in 20 years are gonna crack your pool and you're ready to go to war, absolute war. So the reactions of people and to each other are amazing. Um, but the lessons that, that I've learned is it doesn't much matter who you're talking to, whether they're black, they're white, they're Christian, they're Jewish, they're Muslim, they're Buddhist, um, they're rich or they're poor. We are all people and we have different points where, we're, where we react. But most of the people that you see on Help Me Howard, you see because they reached that point, there was nobody else to call. Rarely are we the first call. Usually our cases are not easy, you know, whereas the first call, it's usually finding the right person. Um, people end up with us because they can't find anybody else. Uh, thank you, uh, Howard. Uh, Dick, Dick and Bunny Blattner, I can hear Dick saying this, he says, be, being the, uh, the official that he is, 
pull permits. It takes longer, it, but it's protection for the homeowner. And, and, and Dick, Dick is, is right. And we, we, uh, we have had permit ones. In fact, one of the great ones was, was getting a special permit for a Vietnam vet that suffered debilitating uh, physical issues, I think from Agent Orange, but there was certain code restrictions and um, there was a way that we figured out that the city would make it acceptable. Um, and Dick is right. The, the codes are there for a reason. I know they can be a pain and some cities can be really, really difficult. But in the end, it's supposed to be for all of our benefits. This is also where people get crazy. This is where you've got those on one side of the political spectrum saying government has got to stop regulating everything. And then you've got people on the other side saying, well, you can't trust people. So you, how are you going to protect the people? And the answer in America is like the answer to most things in life. It's somewhere in the middle. And that's the lesson we seem to have forgotten in this country. Howard, you've been wonderful. One last comment. Somebody talks about, look at Judge Judy. When I think of Judge Judy, she, I think you, you, you got it over her though, but she has a Judge Judy family against one another family member. Hard to believe it, unless you watch her show. And it, 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 becomes, it becomes like, like you become fascinated by this. It's family member against family member, but there it is. It's, it's, it's people's humanity against others. You're so right. Yes. And you know, the, the lesson is, it's the same lesson every one of you know. Your mother's told it to you. You've heard it since you were a kid. Do unto others as you want people to do unto you. Treat them the way you want to be treated. And if we all remember that more often, nobody's going to be perfect. Our life will get better. All of our lives will get better. And in the end, if I could say anything to the world, it would be, let's just be a little bit more kind to each other. Oh. What a wonderful note to end on. Howard Finkelstein, help me, Howard. You have been absolutely wonderful. And thank you so much for, for your you. willingness and your enthusiasm to, to join us at the Friends of the Sterling. And you are now a true <laughs> friend of the Sterling Road Branch Library. We thank you. Uh, thank Hannah, you. Good night, everybody. Good night, Howard. Uh, Hannah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you everyone for attending the annual meeting, for supporting the library on the levels that you do, for being here tonight. And we wish you a very good year. And um, here's to the rest of the year in terms of fabulous programming. And um, anyone who has ideas, talk to us. We're, we're ready to hear them. So have a good evening, Julie. Thank you very much. Thanks to the board. Thanks to our incredible volunteers. And thanks to everyone here for coming tonight. And thank you to you, Hannah. Thanks thank so you, much. guys. Thank Julie. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. See bye you bye. all at the library. I'm looking forward to it. Yes. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank good you. Everyone. Good night.